Um, welcome, everyone. Uh, welcome to the virtual ICM. This is room two, and it's a sectional talk from the section on mathematical uh, physics. Uh, the speaker today is uh, Karol Kozlowski from the Ecole Normale Supérieure of Lyon. Um, uh, 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 Karol Korowski uh, obtained his PhD uh, from the Ecole Normale Supérieure de Lyon in uh, 2008, and he's spe specialist in uh, asymptotic analysis in mathematical physics, and uh, in particular on uh, quantum field theory in one plus one dimensions. Um, he's uh, currently a specialist, uh, um, a researcher at CNRS. Uh, at the Ecole Normale Supérieure. So the title of his talk is Convergence of the Two-Point Form Factor Series in the One Plus One Dimensional Cinch-Gordon Quantum Field Theory. Please. We continue after our afternoon program with a talk by Karel Kozlowski from CNRS and uh, Ernest de Leon. And the talk is about uh, convergence of form factor series in the quantum in Gordon model in one plus one dimensions. I would like to thank the organizers for the possibility to present this talk in person and the possibility to have it recorded. So uh, if I were to strip the result I want to present from all its um, background, it basically deals with establishing the convergence of a certain series where the ensemble of the series is given by a certain n-fold integrals and then one needs to establish certain upper bounds for these integrals, how they grow when the number of integration grows to, to establish this convergence. Uh, but then this results is set up in a certain uh, setting. And so I would like to start by providing uh, three motivations for uh, obtaining this result. The first motivation stems from uh, the theory of uh, correlation functions in quantum integrable models, and basically it deals with uh, trying to develop techniques which would allow you to obtain a fully rigorous, uh, put, put this theory on a full, fully rigorous uh, setting. The second motivation stems for, from the per se setting of the model I will uh, discuss, as then this provides a certain um, uh, simple but still non-trivial instance of a quantum field theory where you can explicitly compute certain uh, quantities. And finally, there's a third motivation for uh, this um, analysis, which takes its roots in the theory of uh, special functions. And then once I have gone through the motivations, I will uh, present you the main uh, result. So first, I will introduce you the model and um, try to provide you at least with enough features of the model so that you can get a feeling where this uh, series of multiple integral arises, and then I will present the main result. And finally, I would like to at least give you a flavor of the kind of uh, techniques you use to, uh, to establish this result. Well, the setting in which this, um, um, this analysis takes place is uh, rooted in integrable models. So they are present in very uh, numerous fields. Uh, there are not many of them, but you, you can find them in many, many fields, be it probability, representation theory, or condensed matter physics, uh, and, and many other cases. Uh, so maybe like the most uh, prominent example of an integrable model is the hydrogen atom, but you also have uh, the case of uh, Gaussian uh, random Hermitian matrices, or a stochastic vertex models, or XXZ spin one half chains, and many, many others. Uh, the reason which makes integrable models uh, special is that somewhere at the root, there is a deep underlying algebraic structure. And the presence of these structures allows you to uh, carry out a certain amount of calculations to the very end and obtain exact closed form expressions for the quantities you would be interested uh, in the model. Call them uh, observables. You can think about some expectation value or, or other things you would be interested from the very uh, interested in knowing from the very setting of the model. So, uh, but there is also a, a bit more uh, to that. So, uh, to, to to illustrate that, I would like to take a kind of a simple example of a uh, integrable model, uh, which would go back to uh, calculations made by uh, Desmoivre. So he was uh, considering uh, random variables identically distributed, which takes value in 0, 1, such that the probability of having x equal to 1 is uh, p. Uh, 
And then he was uh, looking at sums of uh, such random variables, and then you can show that these are Bernoulli uh, distributed. Uh, and because of uh, there is some uh, integrability or uh, behind the, the Bernoulli numbers, you can uh, push certain calculations very, uh, very far. And in particular, you can consider what is the distribution function of this random variable given as a uh, sum of those uh, xk, where you uh, center it around its mean and uh, normalize uh, properly. And then because you have a closed formula for that, you can analyze it and taking the large end limit, you get that it's nothing else but the distribution function of a Gaussianly distributed uh, random variable. So this is a first instance of a central limit uh, theorem. And then once you get this result for this particular case, you may start to wonder how general it is. And today we know it's rather quite general. Going back to uh, integrable models, well, basically you can uh, classify them in big uh, groups. The first group are... Uh, what you would call non-interacting models. Non-interacting doesn't mean uh, trivial. Examples uh, of such models are the two-dimensional uh, Ising model, the XX chain, and many, many others. What one can definitely say is that these are, already, these are already today quite well understood, even on fully rigorous grounds. And then we have another group of integrable models, which you would call interacting. Uh, one example of such a case is the six-vertex model. And in this case, you have uh, still quite a few formal results based on certain um, hypotheses, but the number of uh, rigorous results is still relatively sparse. And then in these, uh, in, 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 for, for such uh, models, what, what one is usually interested in is, well, computing observables, uh, which, which can be typically correlation functions. Think of them as some functions which depend, say, of some space-time variables x and t. And uh, typically, you can uh, represent them as certain series, where uh, the n summand of a series is given by a multiple integral of order a n. a n is some sequence going to infinity with n. And you have an integrand, which depends on the uh, parameters x and t of your uh, observable. And you have a very explicit expression for this integrand. Typically, it's usually very, very complex, so I'm not giving examples here. So immediately, when you, once you get such kind of uh, representation, the first question you can ask, does it make sense? Namely, is the series uh, convergent? So in the case of non-interacting uh, integrable models, uh, convergence is okay because basically in that case, the, this kind of series boils down to Fredholm determinants or minus thereof. So what do I mean by that? Basically, it's a series where the nth summand has a very explicit uh, uh, expression for its uh, nth, uh, uh, as an n-fold integral, where one integrates, uh, where the integrand is given by a certain uh, determinant of an n by n matrix, given by a certain kernel k, evaluated at vari integration variables beta a and beta b. And in this case, you can just apply Hadamard bound, say you have a, a compact uh, integration contour c, and in this case, the Hadamard bound, uh, joined with the presence of this 1 over n factorial normalization factor, give you very quick convergence. But in the interacting case, this is absolutely not so. The structure of the integrand is definitely much more complicated, and you cannot hope to rely on such simple uh, bounds. Uh, in fact, the only proof of convergence which exists in an interacting model uh, is due to Fedos Menoff in the mid-90s, where he could prove convergence in the case of the Li-Yang quantum field uh, theory correlation uh, functions, but in this case, his proof was based on very specific aspects of this model, and it doesn't pass on to more complicated cases. So this leads down then to, to the first kind of uh, motivation open problem, is to set up techniques which would allow you, in a relatively systematic way, to attack the question of convergence of such series, which were obtained in the literature since the 80s, First, for interacting integrable one plus one dimensional quantum field theories like the Cinch Gordon, Cy Gordon model, because there the integrands are relatively uh, simpler, and then attack the case of more complicated models like the XXZ uh, chain. Uh, now I would like to pass to the second motivation, so, uh, which stems just from the desire to build in an as explicit way as possible. A, a, quantum field theory. So what would that uh, be? Well, one basically uh, would start from a classical 
uh, field theory in one plus one dimensional Poisson field phi, which would satisfy uh, uh, this evolution equation, d'Alembert operator plus some potential in the, in the field. And just as one was able to build the quantization of uh, Newtonian mechanics, one would like to be able to find some appropriate way to quantize uh, this classical uh, field. And it turned out to be an extremely complicated problem. On the physics side, there were certain amounts of formal handlings which were developed to attack these problems, basically coined under the name of pass integral and uh, renormalization. Uh, then, um, uh, on, on the side of uh, rigorous results, there are a few rigorous results in, in, uh, in general dimension D, and the situation uh, gets a bit better in dimension 1, where one can prove the, the, um, the existence for a rather rich class of uh, potential phi. There are also specific cases um, where one can say a bit more. The first case is where one just sets brutally the dimension of space and time to zero. In this case, one ends up with matrix models, and uh, in that case, one is able to compute a lot of interesting quantities f from the point of view of uh, correlation functions for such theories and etc. Another setting is when one uh, focuses oneself in the case of one spatial dimensions. In that case, there exists a certain amount of uh, quantum inte uh, integrable field theories, and it's possible to say much more about them within the uh, S-matrix uh, approach. So more precisely, what should one do to, to construct uh, that? So one starts with uh, this uh, a classical equation in one plus one dimensions. And first of all, one needs to construct a Hilbert space on which one would represent the theory. Then, on this Hilbert space, one wants to realize a certain amount of symmetries, a certain amount of operators, which will encapsulate the symmetries you want to have on your uh, physical model, basically a, a representation of the uh, Poincaré uh, group. And then, um, uh, and this is the most important part, you want to construct a set of local uh, operators or uh, which would form an algebra. This is already, um, and these operators, they should be such that, they, that, that you're able to produce a certain lifti lifting of the uh, classical quantities like the field, an exponential of the field, into some of these uh, operators you, you construct. But there are already several uh, problems uh, here. Well, first of all, these operators, for certain reasons, they will definitely be uh, unbounded. But moreover, the symbol O of X I've written here, it should be uh, uh, understood as a generalized um, operated valued uh, distribution. So you also need to regularize that. Once you have built that, you still uh, need to satisfy certain principles for the theory to make physical sense. And in particular, you need to satisfy causality. So if you take two of such operators, uh, su suppose you're, you, you're able to make sense of the commutator of such operators, and you compute the, their commutator in the case where uh, the operators are located at space-time points x and y, which have negative Minkowski norm. In that case, the commutator has to uh, vanish. So this is the first part of the, the menu. Once you're able to do that, you're already able to say that you constructed a field theory. But then you, you, what, what is really interesting to us to be able to apply that to, 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 to really the physical context is to be able to compute in full uh, detail the multipoint correlation function. So what are these? You take a certain privilege vector called the vacuum vector from your Hilbert space. And you just compute the expectation values of certain products of operators you have located at different space-time points. And then what you want to have is to have good control on these um, multipoint uh, correlation functions in particular, be able to say how they behave where the uh, distance between the operators grows or gets very, uh, very small. And once you're able to do all that, then you can start to compare your multipoint correlation functions with uh, things you would get from applying a formal uh, perturbative uh, analysis to a path uh, integral formulation and check that you obtain the same quantities order by order uh, perturbatively. Uh, and then, so in the case of, uh, in the integrable setting, uh, what happens is that th there is a hope to, to, to compute fully explicitly these correlation functions and then because you have a fully explicit expression, you may hope to be able to push their, the analysis of their properties much much further. And then let me pass to the last uh, motivations, which uh, is attached to the special function theory. 
So basically, when one considers special functions, there's not a natural grading in, the, in terms of uh, which you can impose on special functions, which stems basically from their complexity. The simplest special functions you can think of are polynomials. Then you have transcendental functions like the exponential functions, which you can think of as certain limits of polynomials. Then you have higher transcendental functions, the gamma functions, Gauss hypergeometric functions, and many, many others, which you can realize as certain integrals over transcendental functions. Uh, and then you can go a bit higher in complexity uh, and reach the Panlevé transcendent class. So this is a class of functions which cannot be realized by finite amount of integrations of transcendental functions. You need to have infinite amount of integrations, basically like in the Fritholm determinant I've shown you uh, before. So in this class, in particular, you have Fritholm determinants of certain integral operators, identity plus V, where V is an integrable integral kernel, and of course, all the Panlevé transcendents. Now, there is a view on special function theory, which goes back to Bragman, when it was developed in full glory by the school of Vilenkin and Wallach in the 70s and 80s, is that special functions are nothing else, but just you can realize them by computing matrix element in a given representation of a certain representation of a classical Lie groups. And all special functions belonging um, to, the, to these uh, classes can be explicitly realized in this, uh, in this way. Now, when you focus on correlation functions in non-interacting quantum integrable models, what you get is special functions belonging to this uh, Panlevé class. So then, let me show you how, how this works. Consider uh, the Stein-Gordon quantum uh, field theory, which is uh, associated to this, to this classical uh, evolution uh, equation. Uh, and, uh, and you have a certain coupling constant G uh, appearing here. So in the non-interacting case, you can actually uh, compute these objects quite explicitly. So if you consider a correlation functions of certain specific uh, operators you have in this theory, uh, and uh, you consider it the coupling constants to be equal to one, then up to a certain constant, you get nothing else but the tau function of the Panlevé 3 transcendent. Now, if you would plug in the uh, interaction, consider general interaction, the same kind of uh, object uh, would le lead you to a one-parameter deformation of the Panlevé 3 transcendent. And then there are many, um, at least indirect, uh, um, indications that actually the special functions uh, you would get in this, uh, in this way by considering interacting integrable models, they have properties which are definitely way much richer than the functions belonging to the Panlevé class. Uh, and this is definitely something that enters into this framework of uh, representation theoretic construction of special functions. Because basically, uh, here you compute matrix elements, and the operators you have here, they can be actually realized as certain representations of uh, quantum groups. So in this way, if you're able to fully uh, to construct these objects uh, fully rigorously, you're able to reach functions belonging to this class above the Banerjee transcendent class. Uh, okay. So now let me maybe go uh, more into the details of the, um, of the model uh, I want to focus uh, on. So, uh, so the model uh, corresponds to a quantum field theory which would uh, be associated with this uh, classical evolution uh, equation. Uh, it involves a certain coupling constant G appearing, appearing in the sign. And it's convenient to reparameterize the coupling in terms of a parameter B uh, given here, uh, in terms of the original G, and which takes value between zero and a half. The story of uh, constructing this quantum field uh, theory started with Grianik and Vergilis, uh, who are using arguments from semi-classical uh, quantization of this uh, uh, classical equation, which is integrable, were able to argue that the Hilbert space associated to, on which you would build this quantum field theory should be given by a Fox space, so a direct sum of L square to the Rn spaces, where uh, integration variables are ordered in strictly decreasing order. Formally, you can think of uh, functions belonging to the nth component of the Fox space as in incoming asymptotic and particle wave packets. So once you have the Hilbert space, the next step is to uh, construct uh, symmetry operators. Well, the simplest symmetry operator you, you, you want to have on your model is the translation operator by a space-time vector t uh, x uh, denoted by 
y bold. So this operator, uh, when you take, you can construct in the following way. When you take a, a vector belonging to the stock space, so it has a zero uh, component and uh, component being in the L square of Rn and etc. The translation operator will act diagonally on each of the components, and the action of say on say uh, a function belonging to the nth component is just diagonal, is given by the product of plane waves uh, with um, space-time vector y, uh, scalar product with a two-momentum p parameterized by the uh, variables. Uh, beta a appearing in the function, and the form of the uh, two momentum is m cos beta, m sin beta. Okay, so now that you have some of the symmetry operator, the general question is how can you realize on this space general operators of your theory? Uh, so basically, a general uh, operator would be um, would uh, produce you a, when acting on a certain vector f would produce you uh, some component in the zero uh, particle space and particle space and etc. And then how the action on the nth particle space would look? Well, you would uh, write it down as the sum of actions of certain operator O and M, which act on the nth component and so function in M variable and produce you a function in N variable. So O and M goes from L square of Rm to a square of Rn. And because of certain physical requirements you impose on your theory, you want that the x dependence of your operator be factorized by the adjoint action of the translation operator. Now, how does, would, would all of this look uh, more explicitly? Well, uh, you, you, the natural way to realize those operators is to, 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 to have uh, integral operators. So let's, let's look first at how this would look in the case of the zero particle space. Then you need to, do, to produce just a scalar. So you sum up over all components of your vector, and uh, you, have an explicit, you have explicitly factorized the x-dependence tends to the adjoint action of the translation operator, and then you integrate all that versus a certain function of m variables, fm or of beta 1, beta m. This function definitely depends on the operator. Again, from certain principles of uh, quantum field theory, this uh, integral kernel of the linear forms involved in here should be the plus boundary value of a certain meromorphic functions in the uh, integration variables beta 1, beta m, living on a certain multidimensional strip. In the case of a, a general n particle space, basically you need to product, produce a function of n variables, so you get, again, some over all components of the uh, vector f, you integrate uh, with a certain integral kernel, which now depends on the integration variables beta m and on the outer variables alpha n, and you have an explicit x-dependence, again, due to the uh, explicit form uh, taken by the action of the uh, uh, translation operator. So basically, constructing operators in this framework boils down to being able to construct, uh, to say, to construct explicitly the integral kernel fm and mnm. Uh, and uh, in the late 70s, and especially during the 80s, uh, Karovsky Vaish and uh, Smirnov, Kirillov Smirnov, and Kamitov came up with uh, setting up a certain set of uh, uh, axiomatic equations, which are called the bootstrap program uh, equations, uh, which you can at least heuristically interpret as stemming from uh, the LSZ reduction uh, formula. And this uh, axiom you would put on your theory, so you would postulate that all integral kernels arising in the construction have to solve the bootstrap program axioms, uh, take the form of certain uh, coupled Riemann-Hilbert problems in one, two, uh, up to infinity variables, coupling all the integral kernels uh, fm appearing here. Once you have constructed the fms uh, in this case, you're able to deduce again from some of the axiomatic equations, the form of the integral kernels m and m here. I'm not giving, going to give you the form of these uh, uh, equations because they are relatively heavy, 
Uh, but but the point is just to say that this is this is the starting point. And then you have to check once you're able to do that and maybe solve that that the operators you construct in this way satisfy, for instance, the the, the causality requirements so that you build really. Uh, uh, um, uh, physically acceptable theory, and then you can, that, and that you can also make sense of products of operators, and and um, and all that. And the uh, the amazing thing is that despite the complexity of the bootstrap program axioms, it is possible to solve them uh, for the integrable models. There is a very very long history in establishing closed formula for the integral kernels uh, f n and m and m. Uh, and many, many people were were involved. So uh, the bottom line of all that is that you have fully closed expressions for these operators. So then you should go to checking the, uh, that, that all the other requirements I've shown you are fully uh, satisfied by this construction. Well, one way to see it is uh, to look um, what 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 does it give for the case of uh, two-point function of your theory. So suppose you have constructed your uh, Operators, so you can take their, you can just compute their product, their expectation value over the vacuum, and after some massaging of the formula, if you consider uh, two-point functions which are space-like separate, uh, where the operators or building this special, uh, this two-point function are uh, space-like separated, you represent this quantity as a series of multiple integrals. Uh, where the n summons is an n-fold integral, given explicitly of, in terms of these fn's, uh, times some factors which now decay exponentially fast, and this decay, exponential fast uh, decay stems from already some massaging of the formula. And basically, you can then put this in the form of this uh, such a series with some uh, integrant un. So, in particular, to, 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 to check the, the, that, that you can um, ha have well-defined expressions for the two-point functions, you should be able to establish then that all this produces uh, convergent expressions for the, for the two-point functions. So, let me now describe you more precisely the form of this um, uh, nth summoned uh, un. Um, so, the nth summoned is an n-fold integral over the integration variables beta 1, beta n. They are integrated over the real axis. Uh, there is some combinatorial factor, 1 over n factorial 2 pi to the n, appearing here. Then there is a one-body confining potential, which grows exponential of exponentially fast at infinity. R is uh, a strictly positive parameter, and alpha is, is a parameter taking value between minus 1 and 1. So this ensures this exponential of exponential growth at, uh, decay at infinity. Then there is a two-body interaction which couples all integration va variables between uh, each other. It's given in terms of uh, exponential of a half of a certain function uh, w. Uh, this function w is fully explicit. It's uh, given by its uh, Fourier uh, transform. And this Fourier transform involves this parameter b, which was a rewriting of the coupling constant of the uh, original uh, model. Maybe the, the explicit expression for the two-body interaction is not so important. What is important is that uh, the, the typical shape taken by uh, this w, it's uh, decaying uh, to uh, minus infinity logarithmically fast as beta goes to, as lambda goes to zero, and then decaying to zero uh, exponentially fast at, at infinity. But then there is a third constituent of the integral, which is given by this kn acting on pn, of the integration variables taken squared. And this kn is the most tricky part of the integral, which couples basically all integration variables one between the other in a non-trivial uh, way. Uh, it, it takes the form of a certain transform. So you have a certain function pn, depending of, on all the integration variables and on all auxiliary variables uh, l1 to ln gathered in this vector ln, and then you should, should, should sum up over all these vectors ln, where their entry stake value either in zero uh, are equal to zero or one, and you should weight this function pn by a certain combinatorial factor, depending on the integration variables and on the else, and the coupling constant p, as you can see, um, see here. 
Now, uh, when in, in this bootstrap program construction, basically, you would get different operators by using, uh, in a certain appropriate way, different PN functions here. So the first comment one can make is that already this integral is fully well defined. You see that the KN produces certain singularities where the integration variables beta A goes to uh, beta B. But as I told you, the two-body interaction goes logarithmically to zero with a certain coefficient as the two, two variables, integration variables, come close to each other. So this compensates uh, this uh, uh, pole at beta A equal beta B stemming from KN. And further, if Pn doesn't grow too fast, and this is always the case for the operators you would construct, then basically Kn doesn't grow too fast compared to the confining potential, and the two-body interaction is the exponent of the two-body interaction is already bounded. And then the theorem I want to present is that if you assume that the functions Pn are uniformly bounded in this way, so there is a certain uh, constant C1 raised to some power n. Uh, multiplied by some growth you allow in terms of the betas, uh, exponential of C2 beta A to some power K, with some fixed C1, C2, and K. Uh, and this exhausts all the cases of the function P, which arises in the construction of the operators in your theory. Then the series UN, which I've shown you before, converges uniformly whenever this parameter uh, kappa, which is a combination of R and 1 minus absolute value of alpha is uniformly away from uh, zero. In fact, one has very explicit upper bounds on this um, uh, multiple integral, how it grows with n. So uh, there is an explicit coefficient, and then it basically decays almost Gaussianly in n when n goes to uh, infinity, up to a remainder, which decays like 1 over log n. So the first thing one can observe is that there is no R and alpha dependence in the control uh, in the leading term. But it's present in the reminder, and the reminder is not uniform in these parameters. And this is very important, because uh, ultimately, well, you have the convergence of this uh, kind of uh, series here, but you expect that something happens should, should happen with your uh, theory when the parameter uh, R goes to zero, and definitely then there will be problems with convergence stemming from this non-uniformness of the reminder. The second um, comment one can make is that the K is slightly sub-Gaussian. In particular, this means that the 1 over n factorial normalization factor present in the integral doesn't play any role in the convergence. Uh, and, and so it, it, it's something much, much, uh, much, much stronger. Uh, in particular, it goes beyond what you could see from Hadamard bounds in the case of non-interacting model, where 1 over n factorial was crucial to proving convergence. So in a sense, it shows that actually these classes of multiple series of multiple integrals converge much, much faster. And then even in the non-interacting uh, case, the Hadamard bounds were really huge overbounds. Uh, so once you see that there is an almost decay of the summand of such series, this means that the physical uh, series describing you the two-point function converges extremely fast. And this already explains uh, explicitly the observations which were made in the 90s and early 2000s, that on a numerical level, you can compute using these series uh, the two-point functions with extremely high precision only by taking very few terms. Uh, so here I've shown you the kind of um, convergence results for the two-point function. But basically, the same techniques you can apply to show that uh, products of two uh, uh, operators uh, are well-defined. And then you can um, also use that to show that you have local commutativity. Actually, local commutativity, under the hypothesis of convergence of operator products, was established by Kirillov and Smirnov in the, uh, in the 80s, but then to have a full proof of that, you still needed convergence. So now this, this, this holds true. And the nat natural question one can further ask is, can one construct other correlation functions, uh, can one prove the convergence of other correlation functions in the Cinch-Gordon model? So first of all, the convergence for two-point functions in the case where they are time-like separated is definitely doable, but more technical. And finally, to get the convergence of multi-point functions, it's also doable, but more, more technical. And once you're able to reach all that, then you have uh, uh, constructed fully rigorously the theory, checked all the uh, axiom that needed to be checked for it to be uh, well-defined, and you have a fully closed formula for the 
uh, multipoint uh, function. So, so far, this only holds for the space-like regime and two-point functions. And in the remaining time, I would like to explain to you, uh, at least give you some flavor, flavor of the techniques which are used to establish these results. So, uh, structurally speaking, the kind of integral, multiple integrals that appear here have certain similarity with integrals which arises when you, one studies partition functions, at least the spectral part of partition functions, of ensembles of n times n random uh, Hermitian, symmetric or quaternion Hermitian matrices. So in that case, the spectral part of the partition function reduces to an n-fold integral, uh, which contains two terms, a two-body interaction, which is basically given by a van der Mond determinant raised to some power beta, b, beta being re related to the random matrix ensemble you consider. And then there is a confining potential part, which um, acts only on each of, of the integration variable, and the potential scales with n. So for typical distributions of the integration variables, uh, not too close to each other, not too far, uh, the van der Mond part will basically grow like e to some constant time n square. And because you have a scaling in n of the confining potential, the one body confining potential would grow like e to the minus c1 n square. And then the large n behavior of, uh, of this partition function, at least heuristically, you would expect it to, to, to stem from a contribution which, uh, of, of the integration variable, which stems from uh, an equilibrium be between the repulsive two body interactions and the confining one body interaction. Again, there is an extremely long story in uh, uh, op obtaining the large n expansion of such partition functions. Many, many people were involved. Today, it's uh, fully understood on a fully satisfactory, rigorous level. And the bottom line of all this analysis is that the leading asymptotics of the logarithm of this n-fold integral may be described in terms of a minimization problem. So uh, the large n behavior starts with minus n square, and then you should compute the infimum of a certain functional on the space of probability measures on R, which is given here, the integral of, of V versus some measure mu, and then the integral of the logarithmic interaction versus the product of two measures uh, mu. And then you have some uh, uh, one order smaller uh, reminder here. Uh, so in this random matrix case, uh, so you, you have to compute the minimizer. What you can show is that there exists indeed a unique minimizer for this uh, functional. That this minimizer actually for reasonable potentials V is the back continuous. It has some density rho x. And this density has compact support given by a union of uh, uh, intervals. Now, to determine the density of this equilibrium measure, you need to, uh, to, one can show that you need to, its constructions boils down to solving a certain singular integral equation, which I have given here, V prime equals the uh, Hilbert transform of rho x subordinate to the interval j. And the general fact is that you can solve uh, such uh, uh, singular integral equation in terms, by, by using some techniques stemming from Scalarim and Hilbert problems, and then you need still to determine the support G by some auxiliary constraints. Now, how does this connect with, with, with our case? Well, first of all, the, uh, mm, the integral I uh, focus on, well, this case is relatively close to the random matrix case, this case also, except that it's more complicated for the one and two body uh, interactions in particular, but the many body interactions KN definitely do not fall in, 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 in something you could, uh, where you could hope to apply these techniques. Still, if you develop certain amounts of uh, bounds, which I don't want to describe, what you can show is that you can upper bound the original n-fold integral in terms of a certain uh, family, the maximum over P ranging from zero to N of a certain family of auxiliary uh, n-fold integrals, which will integrate over two species of variables, nu and lambda. Um, so, and, and in this case, you fall on something like a two-matrix two, two model spectral path partition functions. Uh, the second point is, uh, I, I've told you in the random matrix case, the two-body and one-body interactions, they were already in a good scale with n. This is not the case here. So it means basically that you need to dilatate in a certain way the integration variables so that the two-body and one-body confining uh, uh, potentials uh, of this upper bounding n-fold integral 
live on the very sa same um, scale. Um, so you need, but basically this means, in the present case, that you need to dilatate the integration variables by log n. And then uh, the integral takes the following form. They are confining potentials for the new and lambda variables, given in terms of a hyperbolic cosine of to n times lambda, to n is this log n. Then you have two-body interactions between the new variables, this, which involve this two-body interaction appearing in the original problem. And you have a two-body interaction also between the new and lambda variables, which takes a slightly different form. And this is where actually the bounds stemming from the presence of this um, Kn factor appear. Now, what, so, so in this problem, what, what, what goes beyond the setting which was used in the random matrix case is that you have an independence of all the interaction, uh, not only in the potential, but also in the two-body interaction. Uh, and also, the two-body interaction is definitely not, uh, not explicit. So the task to, to, to extract the large end behavior from that so as to get a nice upper bound is to, to be able to, 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 to deal with that. With uh, Boho and Guillaume, we developed some uh, probabilistic analytic setting which allows one to deal uh, with such scaling with n uh, n-fold uh, integrals. And basically, by, by, by generalizing this uh, setting and applying some concentration of major arguments, what one can show is that these upper bounding partition functions uh, can be bounded in the spirit of what happens in the random matrix case by e to the minus n squared, the infimum of a certain functional on the space of probability measures, but now evaluated at two probability measures, mu and nu, up to a remainder which is basically log square times n. But the uh, difference in the random matrix case is that this functional is explicitly n dependent and takes this, uh, this explicit uh, form. I mean, the very details of this form maybe are not so, so uh, important. Now, uh, to deal with uh, what one can still show that there exists a unique minimizer, and also um, uh, to slightly simplify the problem and reduce it at least to the problem of minimizing a functional only on the space of uh, one probability uh, measure, what one can show is that there is a lower bound of this uh, uh, infimum by the infimum of another functional, epsilon plus of n, uh, evaluated at a single probability measure. Again, it admits a unique minimizer, sigma ek n, and the functional takes this form. So ultimately, you have an upper bound for the integral, n-fold integral of interest in terms of this um, uh, uh, functional e plus of n, evaluated at its minimizer times some reminder. But now, the constant in front of the n squared term definitely depends on n. So if you want really to say, uh, so first what you want is that this constant is strictly positive for the series to be convergent, but uh, the constant may go to zero with n. So to, to really ensure the convergence, you need to find and fully characterize the equilibrium measure sigma x for this epsilon plus, and then estimate how this constant grows with n when n goes to infinity. And this, is, uh, uh, and this can indeed be done. One can fully characterize the um, equilibrium uh, measure, say that it's supported on a single interval, that this interval doesn't uh, explode too much uh, uh, with n, that it is absolutely continuous in respect to Lebesgue, and you can fully characterize its uh, density and the endpoints as uh, a unique solution to a truncated Wiener-Hopf-type uh, equation driven by a two-body interaction present in this functional e, e, um, e plus, and some additional constraints which fix you the endpoints a n and b n. So this is a more um, general case of singular integral equation than in the random matrix case. But still, you can say a lot of things about the singular integral equation. You can still invert the, this equation using Riemann-Hilbert techniques, but now you need to re recourse to a matrix value at Riemann-Hilbert problems to invert the operator Sn and then be able to characterize all the quantities. You cannot do it explicitly, but in the large n limit, you can apply the dive Zhu nonlinear steepest descent to invert the uh, operator and construct the large n expansion of this solution chi. And in the uh, end, what you're able to, to show is that the density is given by an explicit expression, some functional, of the solution of the Riemann-Hilbert problem. You control fully how this Riemann-Hilbert solution grows, evolves with n. 
So then you have the density, you plug it in into the uh, minimizing functional, and you have some expression which is quadratic in the solution of the riemann hilbert problem. So then using the results from the nonlinear steepest descent, you can extract the large asymptotics and get the conclusion of the theorem I've shown you. So now, what I've shown you is um, uh, the setting up of a certain amount of, uh, uh, of a method, which allows you to prove the convergence of two-point functions in the space-like regime for the cinch gordon model. And to deal with that, one had to, to develop uh, some uh, new uh, techniques, allowing you to deal with non-scaling in n, n-fold uh, uh, integrals, having non-scaling, uh, having uh, scaling with n interactions, and this is used. This is based on the, uh, applying some concentration of uh, measure techniques, riemann hilbert problem, some aspects of potential uh, uh, theory, and soft analysis tools. And then to extend that, well, first of all, it would be interesting to attack the problem of multi-point correlation functions in the cinch gordon model, and then attack more complex complicated model like the sine cone in quantum field theory, and then lattice quantum integrable models. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Are there any questions? So, so uh, is there any prospect? Uh, I mean, there are explicit formulae for one-point functions for the thermal, uh, thermal uh, functions, so or the Euclidean mm -hmm. correlation functions by Lukianov and company. So, is it is it possible uh, to use these methods to actually perhaps check those conjectures or even derive them? So, uh, in, in this framework, there is a, well, basically you can normalize the operators as you want. So, the operators are normalized in such a way that the one-point functions are just uh, one. But you will see, still see these uh, conjectures somewhere else in the theory. Basically, if one would look at uh, short-distance asymptotics in the space-like regime for two-point functions, they should uh, ha uh, have a power law behavior in the Minkowski distance. And the constant in front of this power law behavior would be exactly related to that. But for the moment, this is beyond uh, uh, the, the access of existing uh, techniques. But in principle, there, there, there would be a way to, to, to access that. So, so numerically, one could actually try to check this? Uh, maybe yes, but, but, but then numerically, uh, the, the, the problem is that um, convergence properties of the series become rather bad. Uh, and so one would have to sum many, many, many um, um, multiple integrals to, 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 to get to that, and then this becomes a, a, a challenge. Thank you very much for this beautiful talk. And uh, so uh, thank you all for attending it, and please enjoy 